Welcome back, friends. Hey, guys. It's Christopher and Zach in our blue suits, still working on our electric powered van again. Like always, every other Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in, guys. In this episode, I continue to work my way through my kids' Halloween candy. And Christopher explains a little bit about this. So, this conglomeration of wires and buttons you may have seen in the background as we have worked along. And today, finally, Christopher's going to tell you a little bit about it, what it is, what it does, and how he's making it work. But before we do that, we're going to pick right back up where we left off in the vinyl. We ran out of some time, energy, patience, skill, and materials last mm -hmm. episode. And this episode, we're going to pick right back up with some tests, try and figure out what the heck we actually need to do. Here's that area I'm going to work on, test patches. Just because I want to see how it's going to work, I'm going to put a layer of green tape here, put some green tape around here, and then I'm going to put some, I'm going to try and make this area pretty and then overlap it here. Because if we can do it piece by piece when we're up the whole roof and it looks decent, I think that's what we'll do. That's, should work. One thing that I, I notice is instantly not ideal is this curve. We have to be very careful when we pull that so that it doesn't want to walk the cut in a direction we don't want it to. Okay, and I'm going to go for exactly the tape's width of overlap. So it'll be about a mil and a half. I'm going to follow this as close as I can just for arbitrariness. So, is that what I want? Is that what you want? What you really want? Okay, once it gets started, it's not too incredibly that bad actually, so. Okay, so I'm trying to pull tangential to the curve. Bink! Yeah, man! Not really kind of bink scenario, but bink! Okay, now we're gonna get another piece, do another piece. Scrub is a guy that can't get no love from me. Hanging out at his best friend's ride, trying to holler at me. Good thing about this approach, if we do go with it, is we're only worried about one panel at a time. You know? And when you do that, only worry about one thing at a time, everything's just gonna be all right, man, you know? Because then you can focus on what's really important in life. And I think that's the message we all need to hear around this time of year. Tangential. Woo, buddy, got it that time. I had bad luck on previous curves. Okay, here's a close up of the patch. Um, we're gonna have to have seams in it 
somewhere. The question is how many are we going to put and where? If we go this like every piece has its own kind of patch, it's a lot easier to apply, but there are more seams. Obviously we're going to avoid these guys at all costs. Um, across a big empty curve or big empty field, but I'm not entirely sure we can avoid these. You know, and if it looks okay enough, then maybe that's just what we do all the way everywhere. So in that case, it would be kind of like this. It would be field, a cap, and a cap, and then a field, and then a cap, and then a field. And they would all have their own separate pieces with seams everywhere. It may be the way we go. Apply the film to the target surface with a squeegee. Remove any air trapped in the adhesive by carefully pressing it outwards. If you encounter creases or wrinkles, simply heat the film, reposition, and apply the film again. If the vinyl is not sticking, use heat and press the film into position. If you've stretched the film and need it to return to an earlier shape, heat the film after it's been applied to erase memory in the film. There we go. Simple as that. Lift up. Higher, 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 please. You're good. Okay. We're just going from the center out. That's the game we're playing. Everybody plays it. You sound like Bob Ross. We got a squirrel that lives in that tree. <laughs> oh, and he just loves eating nuts. Every summer, he collects them for the winter. I'm not sure what's happening now. You good? You got it? You're squeaking. Okay. I mean, you're peeling and doing Oh, did you want to trade sides? Is that what you want to do? I don't know. Okay, come trade sides because you got little arms. Well, I'm gonna get this more. Ooh, this is some thrilling, captivating footage, I'm sure. The ultimate city machine, lurking in the alleys, fighting on the mean streets, ready to pounce upon its enemies, ready to destroy its foes, ready to pick up the new groceries. The ultimate city machine. Jeez, man, I can't just eat candy like that. I'll lose a crown. <laughs> that would suck. A whole lot. That may have or may not have happened. Yeah. Like yesterday. All right, vinyl, as you have seen, is done. Thank goodness. It was way more trouble than I thought. And honestly, I might have painted it had I known. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, it's done now. Yeah. Well, from that to something completely different, Christopher's gonna talk about electrical stuff. CAN bus, bits and bytes, ones and zeros, hexadecimal. Do you know what any of that means? Neither did I. But stick around and you can learn. Taking a completely different direction from vinyl on the outside of the van, we're gonna be talking about electronics on the inside of the van. At the current moment, in order to operate our van, it requires two actions. One being to interact with a, a LCD touchscreen that operates the drive modes for us, and the second to interact with a push button that goes to a parking brake controller and then operates the parking brake for us. This is not ideal as there's two separate systems. You have to have knowledge of how the van works in order to drive it. And there's a big old LCD blaring at your face at night. I wanna fix that. Um, I wanna unify these systems. I don't really wanna be touching two different things. 
like a pleb. Most everything on this van is already controlled by CAN. And in theory, if I get the parking brake controller on the same CAN network, I can then control it with a CAN button keypad. And that's what I have here. Let's take a close up. So I have a CAN controller now. Um, it can be programmed with CAN. It can send out CAN messages. Um, and since I can program, that means I can program CAN. And since you can program on a Arduino, that means I can program CAN on this Arduino so that it sends out CAN messages to and from the CAN keypad. So that's what we've been doing. On Wednesday nights, my brothers and I, um, we get together and we do some uh, hacking. We try and figure out what the heck's going on here. Our current goal is actually to get the parking brake controller accessible via the CAN network. It's got a microcontroller on the inside. It does all the things that the parking brake system needs to. It's just not accessible via our fancy new buttons. And in theory, that shouldn't be too hard. All we really gotta do is sniff the inputs and outputs and fake them via controller. Let me show you this up close. All right, so this is where we're, we're currently working and we're currently doing a lot of discovery. Um, see, we have a bunch of microcontroller stuff here um, two big old relays and then switches. These are headers for actual switches that go to the buttons. And in theory, what we should be able to do is we should be able to fake the button press here on this button via these headers, these headers, or possibly even these headers kind of hidden on, yeah, see these headers there. Once we figure this all out, it's just a matter of hooking it up to some GPIO pins on this Arduino and then letting it run. This Arduino controlled parking brake is still a couple episodes out. What we have made headway on is the CAN keypad itself. Now, this is a device that does exactly what it says it does. It sends and receives CAN messages. It does nothing more than that whatsoever. It comes with API documentations that allow you, as the end user, to program it in such a way to send and receive the CAN messages you want but it requires that. So if you are gonna buy the raw device itself without any support from a third party, be prepared to do that. With that disclaimer, let's get into what we've done on this, how far it's come, and a little bit of advice if you're gonna attempt this on your, yourself. So this is what we're developing on because it's got these pins, very nice to use. Um, it's got a pretty friendly API. What we're actually probably gonna work with um, a little bit further down the road is one of these guys. This is an Adafruit Feather CAN M4 microcontroller. It has CAN and it's special in that not many boards have CAN. It's also really compact, much smaller than the Arduino in a couple different dimensions. So look at that. And we've been using this to prototype. So let's zoom in over here and you can see it on this board. Now, this is a mess of a board. It's got wires coming in. It's not super safe. Or we would never drive this down the road, but it's perfectly good for developing on locally. Nothing's gonna get zapped. It'll be fine. And let's show you. Let's show you guys. We have our microcontroller hooked up via USB power to the power supply. We have this guy connected very via these, these this janky looking business. Um, but it'll get 12 volts. So. Let's do it, here you go. Pretty great, right? I mean, you can't argue that that's not an impressive display. Um, that first bit at the beginning where it went bloop, 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 that wasn't us. But these lights here at the end, that is us. And what we're doing to display these lights is kind of the story that I want to share here. Everything prior to this is preface. Um, but we're gonna focus specifically on the CAN messages required to make these lights go blue. Or orange. Just to turn off. Let's actually talk about the CAN messages. Because like I said, you have to program this yourself. Um, and in order to do that, you have to understand the messages going across the wire. So. If you remember, a couple episodes back, we had an oscilloscope. 
That oscilloscope, it took values from the CAN messages and it decoded it for you on the screen. It looked kind of like this. For our purposes of this CAN controller, it has one ID and eight bytes. And if you'll notice that these bytes, they got letters in them. That is because we're actually transmitting hexadecimal data across the line. And this hexadecimal data is a human-friendly way to encode binary data. These values, these hexadecimal values, four and B can be converted individually to four, which is one zero zero, and B, which is one zero one one. Okay, these are actually the binary representations of the value that's held in B, and that's held in four. Okay. Um, we can do the math, we can do the conversions, but there's a lot of other videos out there that explains this. What I want to point out in this situation specifically that we learned is very important. Is that this binary number, 1001011, is equivalent to 01001011. The beautiful thing about binary and the zeros in this scenario is that you can add as many zeros as you want to the beginning of any number and it doesn't change the value. But what it does do is it makes the math and the conversion and all the programming stuff way super easy to handle. Because if we look at these documentations, we see an interesting pattern emerge, okay? These LEDs are individually assigned to a binary spot in the message payload that is then encoded in hexadecimal values for the purposes of transmitting over the wire. So if we have that in mind, we can take a look at the API, we can reverse engineer it and make it do exactly what we want. This controller has 12 buttons we have to transfer data over the wire somehow to address these 12 buttons. The manufacturer publishes an API that describes how these buttons work. Here. So we have an IDUC, right? And we have eight bytes. Each byte has one bit. So keep that in mind if I misspeak. Now in computers and uh, computer languages, most of them are zero base indexed which means that the first number is not one, the first number is zero. It's confusing for humans that are just getting into programming, but for programmers, it's also very confusing. These bytes labeled zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, all communicate data, okay? Four at the binary level is stored as one, zero, zero. B at the binary level is one, zero, one, one. These information bits mean something to this API specifically. And this addresses color information on the buttons themselves. Now, let's take a look at the API and what that has to offer. So if you look at this, on first glance, it's probably pretty confusing. Um, it doesn't mean much other than to see, we can kind of see that there's R, G, and B red, green, and blue values being addressed here. Um, and you can see some numbers that, that, that appear to run backwards for no specific reason. And there's also odd groupings in that byte one handles red values and green values. Byte two handles green values alone. Byte four has a big old chunk of unused data here at the beginning of the string. Now, I, I, we played with this for a while. I struggled for it, if we're being honest, because there's a couple caveats in the process of decoding this. We knew it was gonna be hexadecimal values that we needed to ultimately map to. But in the various steps of conversion and the code we had going, it didn't quite seem to ever really click in place. We put a value into the computer and it would come out like purple and green. It's like, what is this? Right? Um, so let's take a look at this again. 
What they ultimately want to do is they want to address LEDs in this manner here, where we have a value at byte zero, let's say it's 4B, and that value represents these LEDs specifically, red 8 as off, red 7 as on, red 4 as on, red 3 as off and then two and one also is on, okay? These values, 4B, are the encoded hexadecimal values of the binary representation of the colors of the buttons. And knowing that binary is most easily decoded from right to left, the numbering all of a sudden makes a lot of sense. So we can take these numbers and we can see how they're spread out across the different bytes. And we can take them and rearrange them so that it maybe makes a little bit more sense. So we still have eight bytes we're working with. They're still labeled zero to seven. And in this case, we labeled them backwards, starting with seven, six, five, the unused bytes. And half of the bytes, half of the byte value at four, remember which we thought was strange that it was empty and then we have color information. So, starting with the documentation, byte zero is all concerned with red. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then byte one has got the rest of red. So you can see that this pattern, start, this pattern starts to emerge where you have the, the red values down here at one, you have the red values down here at 12, the green values down here at 1, and the green values down here at 12, blue values at 1, and blue values at 12. And they move in this kind of manner. That's the secret, okay? This information is encoded that way so that we're addressing it in an efficient manner, either directly on the chip itself or a really efficient use of programming on the API on the back end of it. So now what we can do, what, what can we do with this? We can take all of these values and we can decide what we want the state of the control pad to look like. We can mix colors. Um, we can turn colors off. So we can make a total of, I think seven or eight colors. So let's just say black is a color, black is off, white is a color, all the LEDs are on. Then you go red, green, and blue, which are pure just on, and then the mixtures of all of those. So red and green would be yellow, uh, green and blue would be like the tealish color, and then there's like a purplish color in there as well, I wanna say. So what we can do is we can determine the value of individual bytes, assemble the binary string, convert that to hexadecimal, and then pass it to the CAN bus, and the color changes. Simple, right? Got it. Got it. I could do it now. You could do it now. Yeah, well, I mean, you need years of programming skill in order to do it. But if no you way. know how it's converted, right? Look, if you know that it's converted and you know how the data is assembled, then it's just a matter of reverse engineering it. So you just create your own arrays in memory, one for the red values, one for the green values, one for the blue values. Then you have a switch that maps to a button array and a function that says, hey, I want button one to go to color red, which sets values in your virtual tables, which are LED one, two, and three RGB values, which then get pre-post-processed on the steps to the CAN, which then gets encoded into hexadecimal, which then gets broadcasted over the wire, which makes the colors change. And you just put it together and it's fine. I wish they could see my face right now. <laughs> Imagine Zach with glazed eyeballs. Glazed eyeballs? No, that was nodding. A, that was an amazing explanation. Okay, so knowing that, knowing how 
the data is encoded, knowing what the data represents, we're able to interact with it however we want to. Um, you can do this really any way that accomplishes the end goal, but this is what we did, and I'll show you that. Over here on the screen, what we initialized our software with is um, we said we wanted three empty arrays, and each one of these arrays will represent an on or off value of each button. So the buttons labeled 1 through 12, well, if red, uh, if the first button wants to be red, this first bit should be red. So we should have an on state here. So we can do something like that and say, okay, the first button should be on, the second button should be off, the third button should be on, the fourth button should be off, something like that. We interact with this object in any number of ways to set the exact state of the button that we want, okay? And so what we can do is we can then begin to populate these objects with values that correspond to the correct states. And then you get something that's more full-fledged like that right there. So for the red LEDs, you would get something like this. Now this is great and all, but this is not the format our API wants. It wants hexadecimal values that are reversed in this backwards format. So that's, that's what we do. We first grab the values that we want and we reverse them. So for the first eight buttons, okay, we'll extract it and flip it. And that gives us something like that, okay? Now we chose the first eight because that corresponds exactly to our API documentation for the first byte. So we take these and then we convert them to hexadecimal and we have something to pass along. And if you'll remember, 4B is our friendly example from earlier. Okay, Christopher, so what you're telling me is 1 through 12 represents the buttons 1 through 12. Mm -hmm. And all those little numbers just are trying to tell you red light on or red light off, green light on or green light off, blue light on or blue light off for each individual button 1 through 12. Basically. Why? I just didn't realize that colorful lights could be that complicated. Yeah, it's kind of a roundabout way to do it, but at the end of the day, that's the only way to do it. Yeah. Well, it seems like a good first test on like coding your own can uh, so that when we move on to maybe some more complicated stuff, we've got our heads around it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all we got for you today. Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep working on this in the background. Probably won't show you another full video on it until we have something uh, complete. But until then, it is the middle of December and the holidays are upon us. So we probably won't put out another video till after the new year. So it's gonna be a few weeks. We'll miss you. I hope you'll miss us. <laughs> until then guys, be good people. Merry Christmas. You can't say Merry Christmas. Why not? You have to say Happy Holidays. I mean, I get it. What's the Pastafarian holiday? I don't know. Mm. Okay. May the peace, love, and joy of our Pastafarian princess be with you through the holidays. Queen Ratatouille. Isn't Ratatouille a squash? Yeah, it's not, it's not even a pasta dish. It would have been so good if you just landed on like a Laguini or something. Like yeah. That. Queen the Queen. <laughs> oh my gosh. That should make the video. Queen the Queen?